Single-payer health care, free college for all, and an end to subsidies for fossil fuel? If Bernie Sanders' agenda sounds more progressive than his opponents, why have so few progressive Congress people endorsed him? This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we pay a visit to the annual Progressive Congress Summit in Baltimore and ask caucus co-chair Minnesota Congressman Keith Ellison, who's stumping for Sanders, what went into his endorsement. Also, Middle East expert Phyllis Bennis tells us why we need more discussion of war and peace in the race for the White House. And I have a few words on rival nations coming together to stop the bleeding. If they'll do it for oil profits, why not for blood? Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show where people who say it can't be done take a backseat to the people who are doing it. Black Lives Matter is a movement that has received a lot of attention on this program and in the media. But there's a lot of what they say that has been being said by people in our political system for a very long time. One of those is our guest today. He's Congressman Keith Ellison. He was elected in 2006 to Congress from Minnesota, where he was not only the first Muslim American to sit in Congress, but the first African American in that state. Welcome to the program, Keith. Glad to have you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about this Black Lives Matter thing. Um, we were talking about it a bit before the cameras started rolling, but this is a, a new story being told in a, or an old story being told in a new way, I think. Yeah, it's very exciting. You know, I mean, the fact is, is that uh, young people, millennials, uh, are they were made, I think, certain kind of promises, you know, that we were going to end segregation. We were going to have this uh, post-racial America and there was going to be opportunity. They were told that if they study hard, they can go to school. They were told things like this. And yet, you know, many of them are getting out of high school and finding themselves in a very tough job environment, in an environment where they got a lot of student debt in a place where they're not, they're disrespected by law enforcement and other systems, and they're just not having it. You know, they're just not gonna just put, sit up with it. They're going to uh, organize themselves. They're gonna make a, a, a claim, and they're gonna and they're gonna push back, and that's what it is. You know, and it's interesting to me. You know, I says I, I'm a person who has children, 19 years old, 21 years old, 24 years old, 25 years old, and. They um, they resonate with the yeah. Black Lives Matter movement. They they think that it speaks for them. They spill. They I've learned a lot right uh, from what they're doing. And I remember uh, when I was that age, organizing rallies against police brutality. I absolutely did many, and that's where I cut my teeth in, in politics. And to see this uh, phenomenon going on uh, again, you know, in some ways, it's really hopeful because I'm like, you know, the the spirit you know, is not died. You know, people right. are fighting back. You know, young people are not apathetic. But in other ways, it's kind of like, wow, we're still here. Do you remember the moment when you decided to move from movement work and organizing rallies in the streets to entering politics? Yeah, I'm 52 years old. But before I was 33, I didn't really like or appreciate politicians at all. I, I believed in organizing. I thought that if you put pressure on the system, uh, the system will yield. You know, like politicians are fungible, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, the idea that, you know, politicians see the light when they feel the heat. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you gotta bring the heat and then they'll see the light. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter who's in office, but you know, uh, a combination of people I met and some realizations brought me to the conclusion that you must change the rules. Mm -hmm. And the, and you, and, and the, that means you have to change the city ordinance. That means you have to change the state law. That means you have to change the federal legislation or get some kind of an executive order. You've got to get your hands on the instrumentality of lawmaking and enforcement. And until you do that, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to sustain any of the gains that you might make. You know, at the end of the day, you know, our quintessential, you know, organizer, you know, Martin Luther King knew that you needed a 1964 Civil Rights Act and a 65 Civil Rights Act and a 1968 fair housing law and you know you needed these things yeah. but how does that look to you now that you served the time that you had not just in local office but in congress well i think that i was right when i made the decision that you have to change the rules but i've never ever let go of the idea that politicians cannot organize mobilize and educate the vast numbers of people that it is important to to get emotion in order to create the environment where those rules can be changed. Mm -hmm. See, so like Nixon was no liberal, mm -hmm. but if you look at laws passed during his time, yeah. you got the EPA, 
you have civil rights law, you have some fair housing law. He didn't really want to do it, but he had to, because that was the political landscape. You have, say, like Bill Clinton, who probably wanted to do a lot of progressive things and did many, but he, well, we still got NAFTA, we mm -hmm. still got the 1996 truck crime bill, which expanded all these, you know, death penalties and stuff like that. Uh, and, and, and that's because we were in a conservative political yeah. environment, right? Mm -hmm. So what could we do if we had some progressive politicians and a progressive movement all moving at the same time? I think we could remake this whole country, maybe this whole world, you know, particularly if we connect internationally. So how are we doing on creating that uh, two-sided pincer movement, movement and politics? I think we're doing well. I think we have a long way to go. But I think we're doing well. There's a lot of promising things happening. I mean, look, you know, uh, you know no matter what happens, no matter what happens, uh, Bernie Sanders has been a contender in a presidential election. A person who is a self-described democratic socialist is like vying for the top office in the world in a very credible way with a well-funded 50-state campaign. And his opponent, Hillary Clinton, is declaring that she too is a progressive which is awesome in my opinion. It means that, that, that the wave is heading in a certain kind of direction. And that, and that is good. And so I think that we're doing good. And then, and then you know, uh, black, we started with Black Lives Matter, these, these young folks that they're, they're protesting, they're making demands, they're growing. They started this campaign zero thing, which is beyond just marching in the street and it's sort of a program. Mm -hmm. And then so the Fight for 15, Good Jobs Nation, Domestic Workers Alliance, uh, all types of folks who are, you know, the, the immigration reform mm -hmm. movement is still rolling forward, and pushing at the, and demanding justice for people. So what will be different in this moment from eight years ago? I mean, we had a movement approach to Barack Obama's nomination also, and a lot of people said the same sorts of things that you're saying, that if nothing else, at least we'll have a residue of this organizing at the state level. Obama was genius in piecing together that coalition of existing grassroots groups, growing it, getting himself a nomination against the uh, establishment Democratic um, team. And then it kind of got demobilized once he got elected. Yeah. What happened with uh, or OFA or Obama for America, or Organizer for America, whatever it calls itself nowadays, uh, in my opinion, was um, it would, the, the gains were not capitalized properly. But we're still so much better off. I mean, look, before Obama, with all the things that I would like to do to improve the Affordable Care mm -hmm. Act, before Obama, we didn't have any kind of major step forward in healthcare reform in America. I mean, other countries must be looking at the United States like, are you people crazy? They are. You right? <laughs> you, you know, you you mean you mean healthcare is so heavily commercialized that you let sick people die? Uh, yeah. If it's not paying me, they can die. Mm -hmm. And this is how we roll here in the United States. Unfortunately, be before the Affordable Care Act, it was so much worse. The leading reason for bankruptcy was medical debt. Mm -hmm. We also passed Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which, mm -hmm. you know, made a stab forward uh, gender equity and pay. And, you know, we also passed the, uh, we did made major strides forward in renewable and solar and renewable energy. Paris, you know, and we did some things mm -hmm. in climate. I mean, you know, we, we, a lot of good things have happened that are progressive in nature. Now, of course, um, the progressive movement has advanced, right? It's advanced so fast that Obama can barely keep up with it, you know? And again, I'm an Obama supporter, I'm very proud of the president, but there's no doubt that I vehemently disagree with him on his trade policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't disagree more, yeah. you know? You but, but, but the bottom line is, you gotta give him credit for moving us yeah. this far down, and you know, the movement continues. With Raul Grijalva, you've co-chaired the Pro Congressional Progressive Caucus. Sure Just have. tell people a little bit what that is, how many members you have now, and then uh, we'll talk about this moment. So there's 435 members of Congress, 71 of them are members of the Progressive Caucus. What is a Progressive Caucus? It's the people who believe that we should prioritize diplomacy over war, that the average working American should have dignity, respect, and fair compensation, and should have the right to organize in a labor union that can bargain freely. We believe that retire, every American should retire in 
and, and, and dignity, that we shouldn't have our senior citizens living in poverty. We're the ones who, who, who believe that uh, uh, it's, it's a good thing mm -hmm. to make sure that whether you're black or you're gay or you're whatever religion you might be or you're female, that these things are not going to limit your life chances. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be fighting against discrimination of any kind. That's who basically we are. Everything you just described, all those principles and policies sound an awful lot more like the Bernie Sanders platform than the Hillary Clinton platform, at least. You talked about trade. She's changed her position, but at least her time. She came around. I'm glad about that. <laughs> uh, how many of you endorsed Sanders? Two of us, so far. So talk to me about that. Well, first of all, um, Hillary Clinton has been uh, a national figure since the early 90s. And I will be among the first to say that she's a person who loves her country and has fought to be a public servant and has maintained uh, her dignity under some very unfair and just unrelenting attacks. Uh, I do believe that she's not the progressive Bernie Sanders is. Mm -hmm. But I will say, you know, uh, in her favor that uh, you can be a progressive and support her, you know. Uh, certainly you can, and uh, maybe maybe we need some on that side to help pull her over. Mm -hmm. But um, but, uh, but but I guess I, the, the the point I'm I'm, I'm well, the point I'm really interested I, in is how point. do we move the needle? <laughs> yes. If even the likes of you in your cohort of seventy one, yeah, feel they have to go with the establishment candidate. She locked a lot of people in before Bernie ever got in. And then those same people um, are reluctant to just abandon her uh, after Bernie got in and started really showing well. Take us back to the campaign trail. You've been stumping all over for, for Bernie Sanders. Who do you see showing up? And to those who worry that he doesn't get race, does he get race? Does he get gender? Does he get this stuff in the way you want him to? Of course Bernie Sanders gets race. Bernie Sanders was was the organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating committee, committee in the early 60s, back when his opponent was supporting Barry Goldwater. Now I don't hold it. I don't hold that against Hillary Clinton. That's fine. Everybody ha should be, have a right to evolve in their thinking. But you ask me if Bernie Sanders gets race. Bernie Sanders has gotten race all his life. Bernie Sanders is when, when Bernie Sanders has not. It doesn't just say Black Lives Matter. Bernie Sanders has a program for racial justice and empowerment. And every day, new African-American supporters are coming on board. Nina Turner, myself, Cornell West. We just got Ben Jealous just to decided to support the Former him. director of the NAACP. You know, the former director of the NAACP. Bernie Sanders gets race. And, um, you, know, you know, here's the reality. A lot of African-Americans just haven't heard about the senior senator from Vermont. Yeah. I mean, Vermont's a pretty white state, and you know, Bernie's been there in the Senate for a few years and in the House, and they just haven't been exposed. I mean, but 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 Hillary Clinton is a household name and has been for decades. How does it make you feel when you hear the language coming from Donald Trump around barring Muslims from entering the country? And what do you make of the response that's come from opinion shapers inside that Republican Party? Right. And his people running against him on the on the Republican side of this nomination plan. You know, when I hear Donald Trump say that uh, no Muslim should be allowed into the country, I reflect on the fact that he said that Megyn Kelly uh, was asking him tough, tough questions because she was on her menstrual cycle. She was uh, bleeding. He said. Yeah, well, yeah, that's his exact words. Uh, uh, and I, re I remember when he said that Mexicans, the, Me the Mexicans are sending people and they're sending criminals and drugs and rapists. rapists. And I think about how he went to a Jewish group and said, hey, we're, I'm a deal maker, you're a deal maker, we understand each other because you guys are all deal makers. And, you know what I mean? And said, I don't need your money, but I, those, my opponents are all taking your money. You know, I, I recognize dog whistle and overt discrimination and the thought I have is this, modern democratic uh, information age industrialized country is not immune from fascism. It's not. The only thing that's protecting us from fascism is our willingness to sacrifice for democracy. That's it. Some uh, charismatic, loud, boisterous, macho man 
who makes people think that what we need is a strong leader. Uh, and, uh, but all you gotta do for the low, low price of getting the strong leader, you just gotta give up all your rights. But don't worry because if you're a white, Christian, male, uh, 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 straight, you know, you'll be all right mm -hmm. and everybody else better watch it. I mean, we, this is what I think of when I see the rise of a Donald Trump and uh, Ted Cruz. I was gonna say, is Ted Cruz categorically different? Ted Cruz is fundamentally the same. In fact, Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz says the only immigrants to come should be Christian. Donald Trump says no, no Muslims. Actually, Donald Trump is more inclusive than Ted Cruz. At least he lets in the Buddhists and the <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that, um, yeah, they, they, are, they are the same. Here's the reality. There are literally millions and millions and millions of working class white Americans who have had their homes taken in foreclosure, who have had stagnant wages, who, have, who are worried about retirement, and who are deeply disappointed that their ability to send their kids to college may not ever come true. And they're wondering why. Yeah. And he is not saying, well, we have to have a fairer economy, we have to raise your wages, we have to have a more inclusive, we need more public investment in education and infrastructure. He's saying, the Mexicans did it, the Muslims did it, those did it, those did it, and you should be mad at them. And to me, that is deception, that's lying, and it's profoundly immoral. And I'm really upset about it. <laughs> it does feel like a time often when the rhetoric gets so harsh that it takes us a while to recover, and the movement, the work that we're doing for longer term ends gets put a bit on the back burner. But think about this, you know, how often do you get to make a full-throated argument on behalf of your neighbors who you care about. It is an awesome privilege, you know, and I don't ever take it cheap. You know, it's tremendous. You know, you and I get to, get to talk to our neighbors about what we care about the most. And sometimes we're discouraging them from bad things, and sometimes we're encouraging them toward good things. But we get to do it, and we got a platform to do it. I think we're pretty lucky, Laura Flanders. I think we're pretty lucky, too. And I think I'm pretty lucky to have you come on the show. <laughs> right. Thanks, Keith. Great to have you. Anytime, anytime, anytime. Phyllis Bennis is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington. Her latest book is Understanding ISIS and the Global War on Terror, a primer. I asked her where foreign policy is in the 2016 presidential race. Here's Phyllis. It's somehow become standard knowledge, which is one of those things that everybody knows, which isn't true, but everyone knows, that elections are not won and lost on issues of peace and war. In fact, we know that's not true. In 2008, the single biggest reason that Barack Obama was elected was because he said, this is a dumb war and I won't continue dumb wars. Of course, he also said he would escalate the war in Afghanistan, and he did. Uh, but that was, you know, that was motivating people in a really profound way. Much of our foreign policy these days, and many of our wars right now, are designed in a way to disguise their reality from ordinary people. The divide between military people and the rest of our population has grown wider and wider. It's not only about the draft, it's partly about the draft. The draft meant everybody had to think about it. Rich white people didn't get drafted very much, but they had to at least think about what it meant and what they were gonna to do to get around it. Without a draft, you don't have that. But you also have the nature of the wars is changing so much with high-tech war, with an emphasis on the drone wars, an emphasis on special operations forces. We're not talking sending 100,000, 150,000 troops to Iraq, to Afghanistan. We're talking about maybe there'll be 30, maybe there'll be 50, maybe there'll be 5,000, but the numbers are tiny, and one aspect of that is there are almost no U.S. casualties. Now, that's a good thing that there's no U.S. casualties, but it means that the casualties that are rising, whether in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, we don't hear about those. So when the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan testified in Congress just not very long ago, he said, after 15 years of war, well, that wasn't his introduction, that's my introduction, but he said, right now, today, the Taliban controls more land than in any time in history since the U.S. invasion of 2001. And he went on to say that the big issue that the U.S. has claimed, but at least the kids are in school, at least girls are getting an education. Well, it turns out that's not true. 42% of Afghan children, boys and girls, 
are either never been in school or they've already dropped out of school because the school can't teach them. I think that some of the reasons of why candidates don't talk about this issue is because some candidates are basing their, their campaigns on funding from the people who profit from wars. You know this notion, nobody wants war, simply not true. It is a huge moneymaker in this country. The, the war profiteers, and we should note, war profiteering used to be illegal in the United States. Now it's not only legal, it's sort of encouraged, you know. And it's not surprising. If you look at the year after the 9-11 attacks, the CEOs of all corporations were doing pretty damn well. And their salaries, their multi-million dollar salaries, rose 7% that year. The CEOs of the war companies, the companies that produce bombs and and planes and warplanes and submarines and all those things, their salaries rose 200%. So that's one reason why some candidates don't talk about it. Other candidates, frankly, what we're looking at now is one candidate, Hillary Clinton, who probably has more direct foreign policy experience than any of the others because besides being a senator, besides being first lady, she was secretary of state. She was the main cheerleader in the Obama administration for the intervention in Libya. Somehow she's not talking about Libya very much, but she's talking about all her experience. But she doesn't have examples to point to of what is succeeding, what has worked. She says, well, the negotiations about discussions with Iran started under my watch. But she opposed them all the way. You know, they didn't happen until she was out. So that's a problem. If you have other people whose views, Bernie Sanders is a candidate who took a very strong position against the war in Iraq in 2002, 2003, his speech on the floor of the House when he opposed, when, when he voted against authorizing war in Iraq was one of the most amazing speeches of the time because he talked about the impact on women and children in Iraq, which is almost unprecedented in, in the halls of Congress. But he doesn't talk about it much now because it's not his strong suit. It's what he's running on is something else. He's running on an extraordinary position focused on the issue of inequality and breaking up the banks. So he's not talking about it. For more information about how to get hold of Phyllis's book on understanding ISIS, check out our website. It's coming up April 15th, U.S. Tax Day. Among other things, that's the day that the Stockholm International Research Institute releases its annual report on world military spending. The number is always mind-blowing, but what to do? To back up, for the last few years, the Stockholm reports revealed that the world spends about one and three quarter trillion dollars on war. Weapons, planes, bombs, drones. The number is nowhere near complete because how could you really tally the cost of lifetime care for the wounded and war scarred, for example, or the lost time and attention we could have paid to other things? The Stockholm number's low, but still, tax day is a good day to release it because it reminds us that we are making choices here. Could we think of a better way to spend one and three quarter trillion? A couple of years ago, the global campaign on military spending invited people to share their ideas and they came up with plenty. Bernie Sanders had talked about some of them, like free college on the campaign trail. But that's the easy part, how to get there. In reality, we're talking about nations that are armed to the teeth and rivals for resources and power. How could they ever come together to act for a greater good, especially if it came at a cost to their pocketbook, you say? Well, they could because they have. We had an example just this year. Remember back to the dead of winter when oil prices were falling and demand was faltering, people were talking about an economic slowdown? Deep in the heart of it, Iran and Saudi Arabia, two rival oil producers and bitter adversaries cut a deal. They had severed diplomatic relations over the war in Syria. They were fighting a proxy war in Yemen. Short of actually shooting at each other, it's hard to imagine worse relations between two countries. And yet there they were, brought together by collapsing commodity prices. The Saudis had already cut a deal with Russia. To stabilize oil prices and preserve profits, warring nations were able to step up and stop the bleeding. It worked for a bit, but that's not my main point. If the nations of the world can do it for oil, wouldn't you think they could do it for blood? Find out more at lauraflanders.com. You can find our podcast there, and you can write to me. Tell me what you think. Laura at lauraflanders.com.
If you're buried in bad news and put off by partisan puff, you have come to the right place. For smarts, not sound bites, in depth conversations with forward thinking people, subscribe right now to The Laura Flanders Show, where all the people who say it can't be done take a backseat to the people who are doing it. Also available as a podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your podcasts. Join us. best represents the interests of people in trouble. In lieu of government, we've gotten used to nonprofit organizations coming up with projects, raising funds, and doing their best to help. Social services in some ways do the soft work that our police and prison systems are doing mm -hmm. a more violent version of. And later, an exclusive report on an upstate New York farm that's feeding people, not the school to prison pipeline. <music> This week on The Laura Flanders Show, first law professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. The exclusion of women and girls actually undermines the ability to see the structural dimension yeah. of the problem. Then we turn to the crisis facing elders. I'm angry because being a home health aide, you're not getting enough money. I think we should get paid at least $15 an hour, the cost of living.